Good morning. We've come to celebrate today. Are y'all here to celebrate this morning? The resurrection of Jesus Christ? Amen. Welcome. We have come to give Him glory, give Him honor. We are here to give Him praise, give Him praise.
let's give him praise for that this morning. We serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we give you praise today, Jesus. Lord, we just magnify you in this house this morning. voice real strong to the Lord this morning. Just say this together. The head that was was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet
His body there would not remain. <laughs> Our God has robbed the rain. Our God has robbed the rain. Oh, yes! this morning. Amen. Amen. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Amen. Come on, give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, it is so good to see all of you this morning on Resurrection Sunday. I just got one question. Where have all of you been? I hadn't seen some of you since Christmas. <laughs> but it is so good to see you here this morning. We are here to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. He lives. As many of you know, we had a very difficult tragedy this week here at our church when an amazing incredible man of God lost his life while helping us with some renovations here in our church and yesterday we had the opportunity at his memorial service to celebrate the mark that he left with his life and I had this pencil with me yesterday this is a carpenter's pencil and Armand always had one of these with him either in his pocket or behind his ear he had this carpenter's pencil of course, with this carpenter's pencil, it's used to make marks. And we talked about how that Armin made a mark with his life. And we had carpenter pencils for everyone yesterday that they could take and go back to our administrative wing. And on those unfinished walls, they were able to write whatever they wanted to write on those walls in memory of Armin and the mark that he left on their life. And then to keep the pencil as a reminder that God wants us to make a mark with our lives. And there's two young men on the stage with me here today that Armand had a big impact on their lives. Left a great mark. These are his grandsons-in-law. The good ones. The good ones. 
Stuart spoke at the service yesterday and just did an incredible job and Josh sang. Man, I tell you what, it's one thing to sing, it's another thing to sang. <laughs> he and Erica sang. Stuart is married to their granddaughter, Lindsay, and Josh is married to Erica. So I asked them today, on this Easter Sunday, I've asked Josh to read scripture, or I've asked Stuart to read scripture, and then Josh is going to pray for us. And so would you welcome to this stage this morning two anointed, fine young men, Stuart Wilkerson and Josh Smith. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, but I'm so thankful for a risen Savior this morning. Amen. Come on, somebody. The Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verses 2 through 6, it says, They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. And as they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. Verse 5, The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is much alive? Come on, somebody. But here it is. The Bible says in verse 6 that he isn't here anymore. He is risen from the dead. Come on, we serve a risen Savior in the house this morning. Come on, let's just engage the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you, Father for the precious Holy Spirit, God. Without Him, we could do nothing this morning, God. We think about the resurrection that we're celebrating this morning, God. Father, people have walked in this building this morning with situations that look dead, with situations that look hopeless. But Father, I'm reminded of the Scripture that says it is not by might and it is not by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So Father, this morning we decree and we declare life over every situation, God. Those that have, Father, those that have have lost loved ones that seem to be lying in a tomb this morning. We call them to life by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. We declare the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead was, is living inside of our body this morning, God. We call to life dead marriages this morning. We call to life, God, dead situations this morning, God. We call to life this morning those who have been living in dead religion. We say let them have an encounter with the resurrection resurrection power of Jesus Christ this morning. Father, we've come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we've come to declare that you're alive, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, hun. Welcome these folks today. I told you. I told, I told them. I said, I might not even get this thing back once they get a hold of it. Praise the Lord. It is an honor to see each of you this morning, and we welcome you. And if this is your first time with us here at Summerton Church of God, we are grateful you chose to be with us here on Easter Sunday. Summerton, can we welcome all of our guests? There is a connect card in the pew back in front of you. If you will just take a little bit of time and fill that card out. And when you're leaving today, there will be some people in the lobby holding up a gift bag. We want to give a special gift to you saying thank you for being with us today. And make sure that you put that card in their hand. Well, let's take a moment and get out of our seat if we can. It's a little crowded today. And let's greet one another with a happy Easter.
some of you that haven't been with us here in a while, you may notice some changes taking place to the facility. Just know we're not finished yet. We're still in process with our remodeling. And so we just ask you to pardon our progress today and progress we are making. This church has a giant servant's heart. And we want to give an opportunity for all of you to connect to a serve project on May the 4th. We will be infiltrating our community, doing serve projects all throughout our community, and we want you to be a part of that. There will be a few people out in the foyer after the service today that will be happy to answer any questions about that, sign you up for a serve project. And also on May the 4th, we have a mission to break the chains of addiction in Walker County. Amen. And on May the 4th, we'll be having our third annual Running for His Purpose run. Jessica Harden, this is something the Lord put in her heart to begin a few years ago. And it just grows every year. And so we're asking you, if you would, if you'd like to be a part of that, all the proceeds from it goes to support City of Lights where we are breaking the chains of poverty and addiction in this county. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers, if they would, please, to come at this time. And we want to give you an opportunity to bless the Lord on Easter Sunday with your tithe and with your offerings. Father, it's at this time of year that we celebrate the example of great sacrificial giving. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's this weekend that we celebrate that sacrificial gift and how He has changed our lives. Today, Father, we give sacrificially so that lives will be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
Amen. Thank you, choir. I know you never would have guessed it, but I want to talk to you today about a place at the table. Anytime I sit down at a, at a, at a table like this, three things come to my mind. Three things. Of course, the first thing that instantly comes to my mind at a table like this is food. Some of you are thinking about that right now. You've already got that Easter lunch planned and prepared and you're like, come on, pastor, you know, get, get this done so we can get out of here. But we like to sit down at the table and enjoy good food. Matter of fact, this table would have been more complete if there was a great big diet Mountain Dew sitting, <laughs> sitting right here. But not only do I think about food when I sit down at a table like this, I think about family. You know, when I was growing up, the family spent a whole lot more time around a table like this. You know, perhaps there for breakfast or there in the evening and um, everybody would talk about what was in store for that day or at the end of the day, what that day was like. It was the heart of the home, really, the table was, the heart of the home. I'm afraid now that we, we gather more around the television set or the computer than we do around the table. But I think about food, I think about family, but probably the thing I think about most of all when I'm sitting at a table like this is I think about fellowship, about fellowship. Because I've had some of my greatest times of fellowship around a table like this. I don't know what it is about sharing a meal around a table with somebody, but it's like walls come down. And the lines of communication open up and you're able to talk about things around the table that maybe you didn't feel comfortable talking about uh, somewhere else. And, and when, I talk about, when, I, when I think about the fellowship around the table, it's, it's not just a, a surface kind of fellowship, it's deep, it's personal, it's intimate. And, and you know, that's the kind of relationship that Adam and Eve originally had with God. I mean, they had a place at God's table. The Bible said that after God created Adam and Eve, that, that he would walk with them in the cool of the day. He would talk with them. There was always a place at God's table for Adam and, and Eve. But then we know that Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They sinned against God. And as a result of their disobedience and as a result of their sin, they lost their place at the table of God. But even though they lost their place at the table of God, if you read on in the story, you see that God returns back to the garden looking for them. And when God returns to the garden looking for Adam and Eve, where are they? They are hiding. And they're hiding because of the shame of their sin. And not only are they hiding because of the shame of their sin, they're also hiding because they fear God. They don't know, is God coming to kill us? Is God coming to condemn us? Is, is God coming to judge us? Is God going to sentence us to die? And so in their shame and in their fear, they're hiding from God. But what they don't realize is that God is pursuing them because God wants to bless them. And God wants to reestablish a relationship with them and let them know that there is still a place for them at his table. I think, that, I think there's a great story in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 9 that is a wonderful illustration of what I just shared with you. And in this story of 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to be introduced to four major characters. Here in the first verse, we're introduced to three of the four major characters. Let's look at the scripture. It says that David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So three of the major characters, you have David, you have Saul, you have Jonathan. Let's start with Saul. Saul is the first king over Israel. 
But because of his disobedience, because of his rebellion against God, God said that I'm going to rip the kingdom from you and I'm going to hand it over to another. And the other person that he had anointed to become king after Saul was David. But now get this, at this time in the story, David is Saul's son-in-law. He gained that right, he gained that privilege by killing Goliath because Saul had said, whoever kills Goliath, whoever kills this giant will get my daughter as his wife. But you also have to understand that Saul doesn't like David. Saul is jealous because the people begin to sing after the slaying of Goliath, the people begin to sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his 10,000s. And Saul also knows that God has anointed David to become the next king of Israel. And that's not what Saul wanted. Saul wanted his son, who is the third major character in this verse, he wanted his son, Jonathan, to become the next king over Israel. Problem is, Jonathan didn't have a problem with David becoming the king over Israel. Jonathan saw that the anointing of God was on David's life. Jonathan saw that the favor of God was on David's life, and he was good with that. The Bible even tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1, 3, and 4, it says that Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And then notice what Jonathan did. Jonathan made a covenant with David. That's so important. Don't forget that in this story. That Jonathan made a covenant with David. And it was a covenant made by the shedding of blood. And what they would have done is they would have taken an animal and they would have cut that animal in two pieces. They would have separated it. And then they would have walked in a figure eight through the pieces of that slain animal. And as they walked... They would talk about the terms of that covenant and they would say, listen, if any one of us ever breaks the terms of the covenant, then may what happened to us or what happened to this animal happen to us. And so he makes a covenant, Jonathan does. He makes a covenant with David and later on we see that David entered into a covenant with Jonathan. And the terms of the covenant was this. Jonathan was saying, listen, David, I know that God has anointed you and called you to be the next king over Israel. And I know that it is common practice for the next king of Israel to do away with, to wipe away, to kill all of the family of the former regime because I know they can pose a threat to you. But listen to me, David. I'm asking you to enter into a covenant with me that when you become king, you will not harm my family that you will take care of my family and that you will always make sure that my family has a place at the king's table. And so it says that Jonathan took off the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Those were the garments and the weapons of a king. And Jonathan is saying, I understand that God has called you to be king. And at that moment, he surrendered to God's plan and to God's purpose for both his life and for the life of David. So let's fast forward a little bit because now Saul and Jonathan both have been killed in battle. And so David, some 20 years later, he remembers the covenant that he's made with Jonathan. And he says, is there anybody left of the house of Saul? that I may show them kindness for Jonathan's sake. You see, Jonathan and I had a covenant, and I want to make sure that I keep the terms of the covenant. So we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we pick it up at verse 2. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. And when a new king would come in, the servants of the old king now becomes the property of the new king. And so Ziba, who once was a servant of Saul, but now is a servant of David, is summoned. And they summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? 
And Ziba answered the king and said, well, there is a son of Jonathan. Now understand, David did not know about this son of Jonathan. Even though they were very close, they were like brothers. He did not know about this son. And the reason why he didn't know about this son is because he's been spending the last several years of his life trying to flee and hide from Saul. He's been living in caves. So he doesn't know that Jonathan has this son. Until Ziba tells him, and he said, yes, that he has a son, but he is lame in both feet. Well, what's the story behind that? Well, we find that in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, where it says that Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. He's the fourth major character in this story. Now, try saying that name three times real fast. No, don't. You may say something you shouldn't. So Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. And look at this. It says that he was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. Well, what are they thinking? They, they get the news that Saul and Jonathan's been killed in battle. And they're thinking, well, the bloodbath is about to begin. David is about to wipe all the descendants of Saul and Jonathan off the face of the earth. And so the Bible says that when the child's nurse heard the news, she picked up Mephibosheth and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. Now, it's very important that you remember this as we go through the story that Mephibosheth was crippled as a result of someone else's fall. And so David has Ziba go to where Mephibosheth is and summon him to the king's palace. And we pick the story back up in verse 4. David said, well, where is this son of David? The king asked. And, and Ziba answered and said, he's at the house of Makir, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Everybody say Lodibar. Lodibar. It almost sounds like we're saying Lower Debar, don't we? And that's basically what Lo, Lodibar was about. Lodibar means a place of no pasture, a place of no life. A place of no fruit, no joy, no peace, no hope, no future, no purpose, no plan. And that's where Mephibosheth is. He is hiding out in Lodabar, fearing for his life in a place of refuge. But then notice what happens. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. Now, can you imagine? Here Mephibosheth is. He's probably about 22 years old now. And all of a sudden, he hears a knock on the door. And on the other side of the door is Ziba. And he's saying, Mephibosheth, the king has summoned you. Well, he probably thinks this is it. This is the end of my life. I knew sooner or later he was going to find me. I knew sooner or later. See, you also have to understand that the name Mephibosheth, guess what it means? It means shame. And here he is in Lodabar, living in shame, maybe because of his crippled condition, when Ziba shows up and summons him to the palace of the king. And he thinks he's being summoned to the palace because the king, he thinks the king is going to sentence him to death. But notice what happens when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth. Now, I really believe that Mephibosheth was expecting to hear the condemning, judgmental voice of God about to sentence him to death. But instead of hearing that voice, instead he would hear the voice of grace and mercy and love. Because David would say, Mephibosheth. And he said, at your service, he replied, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've not brought you here to do you harm, David said. But he said, I brought you here to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm not here to show you kindness for your sake. I'm here to show you mercy for your father, Jonathan's sake. 
And then the score, the story goes on and says, don't be afraid. I'm going to show you kindness. But he says, that's not all that I want to do for you, Mephibosheth. He said, I want to restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. What? Can you believe this? I mean, here he thinks that he's about to be sentenced to death. He thinks he is about to die because of his bloodline. But instead, the king is wanting to bless him. The king is wanting to show him kindness, mercy, because of a covenant that he had with Mephibosheth's father. But he didn't stop there. He said, I don't want to just show you kindness for the sake of Jonathan. And I don't want to just restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather and to your father. But notice, he said this. He said, and you will always... You will always eat at my table. Can you imagine one moment he is in Lodabar, hanging out in fear, hanging out in shame, afraid of what the king might do to him, but then the next minute he is seated at the king's table. Amen. And... And and then notice how this story continues to unfold. It said that Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? You see how Mephibosheth feels? He feels like the lowest of the low. That he is so undeserving. And undeserving he was, but he's about to receive something because of a covenant that even though he didn't deserve it, because of the covenant, he receives it as a gift. And it says that he said, Why? Why should you notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, may be provided for. And Mephibosheth grandson of your master will always eat at my table. And then he just let us know that Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. But now they all belong to Mephibosheth. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth, I love this, he ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Oh, can you imagine that? That when Mephibosheth comes to the table. He's got Absalom over here. He's got Amnon over here. He's got the other sons of David sitting with him. And here's what I love. When Mephibosheth is sitting at the king's table, he looks like everybody else. You can't see that he's lame. You can't see that he's crippled. Why? Because his condition is now hidden by his position. Now that right there will preach. And it goes on and says that he ate at the king's table like one of the king's son. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Now I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking pastor, what in the world does this have to do with Easter. I'm so glad you asked that question. Only everything, that's all, it has to do with Easter because the weekend of that very first Easter, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat down at a table like this with his disciples. And the Bible said that he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But he wasn't finished. He goes on and says, After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new what? The new covenant the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement, Jesus says, confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice 
for you. You see, what's happening in this passage of Scripture is a covenant is made between God and his people, and it's confirmed by the blood of Jesus. What I want you to see is that in this story, King David is a picture of God the Father. Jonathan is a picture of Jesus Christ. Mephibosheth is a picture of every single one of us. But notice, our Jonathan, Jesus, enters into a covenant with the Father. And he says, if I die, he said, I'm going to die so that they, the Mephibosheths, can live. And so Jesus gives his life. He is crucified on a cross. The blood flows. He is put in a tomb. But three days later, he rises again. And after he rises, about 40 days after his resurrection, the Bible says that he ascends back to the right hand of God the Father. And the moment that he sat down, the Bible tells us that God the Father sent the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit could be a type of Ziba because when the Holy Spirit came, do you know where he went? He went straight to Lodibar looking for Jeremy Davenport. Straight to Lodabar, looking for Jeremy Davenport. I've heard your story. Your story fits Mephibosheth. Your story fits Lodabar. But the Holy Spirit ascends from heaven. And he goes straight to Lodabar for Jeremy Davenport. And he knocks on the door of Jeremy's of, of, of the place where Jeremy has been hiding out, separated from the Father because of his sin and the shame that he is experiencing because of the sin that has been in his life. But the Holy Spirit knocks on the door and says, Jeremy Davenport, the king has summoned you to the palace. Oh, hallelujah. The king has summoned you to the palace. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I can't get there by myself. I'm crippled, and I'm crippled because of somebody else's fall. You see, every one of us are crippled because of the fall of Adam and Eve. We are born sinners. We are born with a sin nature, but the Holy Spirit comes after us. And I know, Jeremy, I've been there. I know you can't get there by yourself. So he sent the Holy Spirit to help you get to the palace amen come on let me help you let me help you get up get up amen get up i'm gonna help you the holy ghost helps us he helps us oh and we come hold on i'm not done yet we're not done yet we get to the king's palace and when we get into the king's presence, we feel so unworthy that we bow, 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 Jeremy, that we, that we, that we bow before him. And we feel so unworthy. Who am I that you would want anything to do with a dead dog like me? But the king, here, here Jeremy is. He's expecting to hear the voice of condemnation. He's expecting to hear the voice of judgment. He's expecting to hear the gavel fall saying you are guilty and the sentence of death but instead he hears the voice of a loving graceful merciful God hallelujah oh yes he does and he says to him, listen, boy, he said, what I'm about to do for you is not because of who you are. It's not because of where you've come from. It's not because of what you've done. It's because my son shed his blood so that you could live. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, here's what, I'm not done. Here's what Ephesians 4.32 says. It says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, for whose sake? For Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So it's not because of who you are. It's because of who Jesus 
is and what he has done. But you know what? He said, I, I don't want to just show you kindness. And I'm not just going to restore back to you everything that the enemy has taken away from you. But he said, here, come on. He said, I'm going to help you up. He said, because you were meant and you belong right here at the king's, at the king's table. <laughs> oh, yes. Hallelujah. You see, here's the way Jesus said it in Luke 22, 29, and 30. He said, just as my father has granted me a kingdom, he said, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. <laughs> well, I think that Paul probably summarized it best in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. When he said, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Notice, it didn't say once you were sick. It didn't even say once you were lost. It said once you were dead. It wasn't resuscitation that I needed. It was resurrection that I needed. It wasn't resuscitation you needed or Jeremy needed. It was resurrection that we needed. We were dead. And he's not talking about physical death here. He's talking about spiritual death. We were born with a dead spirit because of our sin. But then notice what Paul said. He said, once you were dead, but God. Once you were dead, but God. One more time. Once you were dead, but God. But God, the king, is so rich in mercy. Mercy is when God gives us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve it. It's his mercy. It's his kindness. And he said that he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Those of you that need the Easter story, there's the Easter story right there. We have a place here because the tomb is empty. And what was dead, because he lives, what was dead can live again. Even my dead spirit that was dead because of sin, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that when I put my faith and trust in all that Christ has done, my spirit is quickened. My spirit is brought back to life. And notice what he said. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. But he said, understand, no, you don't deserve it. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. But look at this. He raised us, just like I did Jeremy a moment ago. He raised us up from the dead along with Christ. And what did he do? He seated us with him. <laughs> Stay right there. I'm going to join you. Stay right there. Seated us with him in heavenly places. Do you know what awaits you at the heavenly table? Salvation. Deliverance, healing. Jeremy, could you, could you pass the hope? Could you, could you pass the purpose? Hey, give me, give me a double scoop of the joy over here. And I'll, I'll take extra peace. I'll take extra peace. I need that right now. I'll take extra peace. 
You see, that's what you find at a heavenly table. And he has seated us with him in the heavenly ribs. Thank you so much, Jeremy. You can go back and be with your wife. Amen. Seated us with him in heavenly places. Why? Because of Jesus. Because we're reunited with him. Choir's going to come and do a song right now about this. And after they sing it, I'm going to come back with an invitation. I believe Holy Spirit is ready to save, heal, and deliver on this Easter Sunday, 2019, at Summerton Church of God. Come on, team. started on the outside the outside looking in with no hope for the end we were hungry we were thirsty with nothing left to give oh the shape that we were in and just when all hope seemed Open the door for us. He said, Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the Just come to the table. 
the spirit of the Lord is knocking on somebody's heart right now Jesus said behold I stand at the door and knock if any man will hear my voice behold I will come in and sit at the table with them and bless them I know this is Easter Sunday And I know that some of you may feel an urgency to leave and to get to where you're going, but I believe God wants to do a work in some individuals' lives here today, and we're going to take a moment for that to happen. Just before the service started, Jamie came to me with something that the Holy Spirit had shown her about what He wants to do in this moment. And as she shares this, I want all of our prayer partners that we've asked to help us today, if you would please step out and come and stand here at the front because I believe there's a host of people that want to come to the table this morning. Hun, come. Yes, yes, as they are coming, I was in prayer this morning before the service started and I didn't know what direction Victor was going. But the Lord said that there would be people here today who are crippled in spirit. Life has hurt you, damaged you, And you're so crippled that you've become numb, completely numb. Like a crippled, you've lost feeling. But the Lord said today, He was restoring feeling. And just like when nerves start waking up, if you've ever had surgery, and those nerves start to wake up, there's a tingling and a burning. And that's, the Lord said there would be an awakening in the spirit of people today where that burning that you have have not sensed in a very long time is, is happening today. And the Lord is awakening hope in you again today. You thought that that thing was over, dead, and gone. But today the Lord is letting you know He's restoring, reviving, resurrecting those things. He's healing. He's bringing back to life the things that you wrote off. And every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, there is burning in the spirit and the souls of people in this room right now. I feel it. They feel that hope once again, Lord. And God, as you are speaking over them, maybe it's someone who needs to just come back home today, restore relationship today. Maybe it's someone who's never even known or heard of your love, Father. There are other people in this room who are going through difficulty and feel hopeless today, who are facing crisis and struggle. God, you know the situations. But right now with everyone in this room, if you would say with absolutely no one looking around, if you would say, Pastor Jamie, that's me. First of all, I want to speak to those who would say, I need to come home to the Father today. I'm ready to come home. I want a seat at that table. I want you to raise your hand high so that I can see it. One, two, raise it high so I can see it. I see two people here. Three, four, five, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Holy Spirit is drawing you. You can feel the burning in your being. You know, I need the Lord in my life. I need to make it right with the Lord in my life. Five people. Anybody else? That's me. That's me right where I'm standing. Six. I just saw another hand. Six. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer with me. Let's all stand and say this prayer together. Let's say this prayer together. Say, dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you to forgive me of my sins. You said in your word, 
if I confess my sin, that you are faithful and you are just and you would forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Thank you for dying for me. I'm gonna live for you, Jesus. Help me understand it more. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for six people? And I believe there were some more just then. But now I know there are people in this room and you have given up hope on some things. And the Lord is wanting to restore hope for you. Deanne, the Lord is restoring hope today. For all the brokenness, all the mess, God is restoring hope for you and your children and your children's children. There are others in this room for you and your children and your children's children. He's restoring hope. And if that's you, if you say, I need, I need the Lord to do a work in my family. I need the Lord to do a work in my, on my job, in my physical body. I need the Lord to work. I want you to raise your hand high wherever you are. Just raise it high right where you are in my family. Yes. Raise it high so I can see it. Yes. 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 Anybody in the balcony?